Hello, beautiful dragon people, it's me, your pal Vero, here to bring you the final part of the Art of the Dragon Prince review. So, as always, if you haven't been watching this series and this is the first video that you're on, don't worry about it. I just go through very casually, look at all the art. If you haven't seen the past videos, it's fine. You can watch them in any order that you want. Or, <laughs> or not at all. <laughs> anyway, let's get right back into it. This creature is really cool. I actually really like the design of this thing. I love its neck. It's got like a really interesting neck where it kind of like curves inward like that. And that that's really cool looking. It's kind of like this weird camel dragon lizard horse creature. And I really like it. Ah, yes. The Wonder Wall. Very pretty. And we get to see the Midnight Desert. <laughs> we get to see the black sands of the Midnight Desert. <laughs> when a creature's soul is sucked away by a soul fang serpent, all that's left is a pale, furious husk. Is that right? Does it say furious? Furious husk. Oh. How is a husk furious? I think I'm overthinking this. <laughs> furious husk. Okay. Some more art of the Wonder Wall with Rayla looking out. This really is a really pretty place. This would be a really nice place to revisit in another season. Though it looks horrifyingly painful, the, the thin membrane spun by Erevos' creature feels like a magical contact lens. Oh, okay. So, it looks horrifyingly painful, like, it looks, it looks, like, that, that scene makes me kind of, like, uh, like, tense up and have a little, little trouble breathing every time that I watch it. <laughs> and then we get to see Viren's passage across the border was inspired by Moses' parting of the Red Sea, which is pretty obvious to anybody who has ever watched the, the movie The Ten Commandments, where you can very clearly see that they're drawing inspiration from that, and it's, it's pretty neat. Doing that with a thing of lava, though, so much cooler than water. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the Dragon Prince is better than the Bible. I'm just saying that in this one specific instance, I mean, lava is cooler than water. That's what I'm just saying. Just wa <laughs> lava is greater than water. <laughs> oh, look at this. Ah, Lu Jane. I love Lu Jane so much. We get to see, like, different alternate, uh, like, the, uh, costumes for her. I dig this. Oh, I love these. I love this. I love the hat, though. I'm glad that they kept the hat. The hat is great. <laughs> this is great. I really love this, like, light blue. I, th it's, I think she's wearing, like, blue lipstick, too. Like, you go, girl. You do your thing. I like that. <laughs> like, <look. laughs> Viren intended this broken link symbol to be a badge of shame for the soldiers who refused to join him. Although, it also works as a wonderful symbol of when, what Harrow was talking about at the end of Book 2 when he was talking about breaking the chains of history. This is perfect for that. You know, it's a perfect symbol, so it works well for that. Then we get a little bit of storyboards of Harrow slaying the King of the Dragons. After the Dragon King's death, the Great Plains beneath the Storm Spire became known as Thunderfall. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. <laughs> that's why I love these art books. I always learn so I always learn some new stuff. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know if that's like already like known information and I'm, I'm just out of the loop. <laughs> but uh, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, then we get to see poor Thunder. Oh, uh, poor, poor Thunder. Yes, Ibis. I love this guy. This guy is 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 so cool. Now this was a character from book three that didn't have a lot of screen time that I actually did like. Ibis is a powerful and wise Skywing elf mage who watched over the Dragon Queen during her great slumber. Though he was not born with wings, he is one of the rare few who can fly by conjuring mage wings. <laughs> Which is pretty sweet. <laughs> I really like these alternate like versions of him. These these other kind of like color palette designs are kind of interesting, but I I really dig this one down here. Where he looks like he's like like a super chill dude. And like, it's like straight out of like an anime down here. I, I really like, I like these designs a lot. Ah, Cassif, Cassif, <laughs> Cassif evolved. Driven by a hunger for vengeance, Cassif eagerly allows Viren to magically strengthen him for the strike against Zadia. The result is a twisted and horrific monstrosity that reflects the searing hatred in Cassif's heart. So one thing I'm really curious about, so this like form that they get transformed into, now, that kind of, like, fiery form, that's something that the Sunfire Elves can kind of turn on and off. And I am curious if this kind of format he's in now is going to be permanent 
Or are people like that going to be able to learn how to go back between the two forms? Or will it just kind of like wear out over time, not being connected to the Sun Primal anymore? I'm really curious to see what happens with that, and I really hope there's an answer in the future. Final battle, Viren. With a crown of Catullus, the plain robes of a Luxorian prisoner, and his hideous true face, Viren's presence is as terrifying as he enters the battle at the Storm Spire. I really like some of these alternate versions of it. I, I, the more gold they add, the better. It wouldn't make as much sense for prisoner robes if they had like a bunch of like really ornate designs and golden things on them. So I get why they went with the more plain design, but I really dig these. Like, these are really cool. In its first stage, Erevos' conduit to Viren was almost described as cute. Yeah, I still think he's cute for a little bug creature. He turns into a nightmare pretty quickly. As soon as <laughs> when he grows, he kind of becomes terrifying, but you know, a little bug pal. The Sun Forge burns at the center of Luxoria as the source of the citizens' power, both physical and spiritual. The events at the Sun Forge catapulted the worm from a lap catapult to a writhing creature of darkness. Yeah, it becomes like quite terrifying. <laughs> but it was corrupted in the aftermath of Viren's dark magic. Black tendrils befoul the orb. Black tendrils befoul the orb that once emanated purifying light. So I'm wondering if in the RPG, I know they said that we were supposed to be fixing the Sunforge, and I'm wondering if that's referring to this part of the show, that it's corrupted with dark magic and we need to go to Luxoria and purify it. So that would be pretty sweet if that's the case. I am so looking forward to the tabletop game. I've already got a bunch of friends ready to play it with me, so it's going to be so much fun. Then we get to take some look at the Storm Spire and the many, many steps leading up. We get to see the entrance to the Storm Spire right here, and it's very nice. Zubea, the queen of the dragons, and the only mother character who is alive and in the show. <laughs> the only mother character, Zubea. Zubea, queen of the dragons, ruled along Avizandum for centuries, but the pain of losing both her mate and her baby was almost too much to bear, sending her into a deep slumber. Can Zem reach her before it's too late? <laughs> it's making me think of Star Wars. <laughs> She's lost the will to live. <laughs> She's dying. <laughs> Down here we get to see some variations of Zubaya with some different color patterns, which are really cool. Oh, we get a little cute of her, like, nuzzling the Abyssandum. That is adorable. That is so cute. Then we get to see the inner part of the Storm Spire, where Zubea sleeps, guarding the nest, which lays empty. <laughs> then we get to see Teardrin and Lane. Rayla tells Callum that her parents are dead because the truth is much more painful and complicated. Teadrin and Lane, once part of the Honored Dragon Guard, were believed to be cowards and oath breakers and were banished from the Silver Grove. Rayla later learns that they both kept their oaths and fought Viren to the bitter end. But is there more to their story? Well, I mean, yeah, probably. <laughs> like, it'd be pretty cool. I mean, they're probably in the coins, right? Like, they're, like they got sucked into the coins. <laughs> like uh like there's like the the part in the in the book where Runan looks at the coins and he recognizes two people that disappearance never made any sense to him like the brave dragon guard <laughs> so probably more to them <laughs> while designing lane artists explored alternate color palettes for the regalia of the dragon guard the Dragon Guard have a unique role and a distinct look from the assassins of the Silver Grove. Callum sketches Tiedrin and Lane for Rayla after his visions of the past. As the Dragon Guards are prestigious warriors, we explore several ornamental pieces for their outfits. I love that kind of stuff. I really, really love the Moonshadow Elf design of their various trinkets and architecture. I think it's so cool. We get another interior look at the inside of the Storm Spire. Unprotected and unguarded by the dragons, 
Zim's egg lays defenseless after the Dragon Guard are defeated. We get to look at some different decorations that are in the cove, which are pretty neat. I never noticed these these two dragon signs here. So, this is called the Storm Spire, and this is where Avizandum lives. So, is this like the Castle of Dragons? Did Sol Regum used to live at the Storm Spire? Or did he live somewhere else? <laughs> You'll have to stay tuned to find out! I have so many questions to ask. They need to do another uh, Q&A. <laughs> Winged Callum. Manos Plumus Volantis. Callum's new spell allows him to transform his arms into mage wings! A trick he picked up from Ibis, but couldn't perform until the last desperate moment. Yes! The moment that makes my heart swell with love and all the good feelings every time I watch it. Like, I still get chills every time I rewatch that scene. It's just like, mm, The feels! <laughs> it's good. It's very good. We get to see the technical complexities of the battle with all the various armies being knocked down and fighting. Our heroes make their last stand with the remaining Sunfire Elf soldiers. Hopelessly outnumbered by Viren's Army of Darkness, the final battle was the greatest artistic and technical challenge the team had yet undertaken, and everyone rose up to bring this chaotic, magical, epic siege to life and close out the first chapter of the Dragon Prince saga. And it was awesome! Man, my just thinking about it gets my heart pumping. Like, there's so many cool moments in that scene. Like, I don't usually think of the Dragon Prince as like an action show. But that, that, that scene was, or the, well, sequence, was really impressive. It's no coincidence that the swirling torrent Viren uses to attempt to absorb Zim's power resembles a certain other Dark Mage's spell. Yes, I have a really interesting theory about the staff that he uses and its importance, and whether or not it's going to be the catalyst to destroy all the magical creatures in the final chapter of the show. But we're gonna have to wait and see for that. <laughs> and after that, we just get to see a bunch of the end credit artwork here collected. And it's really great and cute. But beyond that, we are finished. My dear, beautiful dragon people, we have done it. We have gone through the entire Art of the Dragon Prince and looked at all of its wonders and secrets. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked the video, please remember to like and subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.